everyone i am going to take you through the steps i took to design and build this rear house extension and i hope it helps you in your own build projects to avoid mistakes and difficulties in what is actually a fairly predictable set of requirements all you need is some time some patience and a bit of knowledge now i can't help you with the time and the patience but i can help you with the knowledge in a separate video I'll be including the pre-build stuff such as how I designed it and what I would do differently but let's start with an overview of the whole process. Now with the site set up and materials quantified and ordered let's start with the foundations. The stages to consider are the setting out of the foundations, digging and trenching and the most exciting bit perhaps is doing the concrete pour yourself either by hand using a mixer and some hand tools or getting a ready mix concrete company to deliver it to the front of your house it's almost always the groundworks that hold up a project so taking control of this really makes sense for the home builder check out my videos in the links to see how you really can do it then on to the trench blocks, building the masonry up to a point where the floor joists will rest on it since we're building a timber floor for this extension. Just make sure to get those block courses dead level and square to the existing building as this sets out our building and our horizontal courses for the facing brick. Now although I'm happy to do small amounts of masonry myself, for laying brickwork of this size and nature where experience is everything and especially for facing brick this is one of the few trades I'll subcontract out. After laying a load of brick courses it's a complete disaster to find out that your setting out is wrong or your horizontal courses are not level with the existing courses of the existing house. At the same time as focusing on trying to get the bricks right you also need to be thinking about your mortar mix and keeping it from hardening. Not very easy. Now it's the time to seal the undercroft of the ground floor or solum as it's called and ensure it's properly treated from potential damp pathways into our new extension building. And let's not forget to ventilate it. I made a separate video about what a solum is and you can see that by clicking the link in the description below. We use a damp proof membrane and then pour a concrete mix onto it, usually 50 millimeters thick, to form a sealed base. Next it's on to the demolitions or downtakings as we call them. By doing the solum first we create a solid and even base for our temporary props or acroprops as we call them rather than having them rest on the uneven surface of the old back garden and I intend making videos on how you can do this work as there's a lot of stages to it and there's a lot of preparation that a well-informed novice can do to keep costs down. But if you're not confident in this, I'd always suggest instead using a properly insured builder, even if it's just for this part, where they'll prepare a method statement based on the engineer's drawings, as well as a health and safety plan. Now, this was a fairly intensive demolition as I wanted to create an opening along the entire wall to create that really nice open plan effect with the living room, a dining room and the kitchen all coming together. So with no columns in the middle of the wall, it meant literally holding the entire side of the house up whilst the opening was made and before getting the steel beam in. Onto the steel where I asked for the beam to be made in three parts to make it easier to carry a manoeuvre from the front down the side of the house but also to manoeuvre it between the props and get it in place. Much harder with seven and a half metre long, huge piece of steel. The whole thing went in within a few hours work with a little bit of help from the steel fabricators men. Once we've dry packed and checked for any settlement, we then get the props out of the way and it's time to start finally on the main structure of our extension. And this stage usually kicks off with the ground floor joists. Here we're using the sizes as noted on the engineer's drawings, making sure we've got the right grade, right size and the right centers for the floor timbers. 
we're checking for fixings and joist hangers too and getting all of this quantified and ordered well in advance of starting the project so we can have time to organize and stack materials as we use them and no time is wasted when we're actually on the job hammering stuff in looking for things that aren't there which is maddeningly distracting uh, I usually create a 3D model of the frame of the extension where I build within a virtual world all the building elements and this really helps me reduce mistakes and accurately see any future problems. It also helps me with ordering my materials and for quantifying my materials. See my other video on how you can easily do this just with some very basic and free tools that you can download. However, sometimes I'll just take the 2D construction drawings and mark them up if I've not been involved with the design, for example, without creating a virtual model. Now with our floor set out and the footprint of the extension completed, before we get too far, it's time to set out the drainage below the floor as we are creating a spanking new kitchen with two sinks, one of which is in an island unit, and although we have our drawings, it's often the case that what's drawn is different from what's actually built when it comes to connecting onto existing drain pipes. So check that all the pipes will work with the required gradients and you can actually get your hands into the existing drain pipes to make the new connections. In this case, it's easy since kitchen sinks just require 40 millimeter pipe work but where it's for uh, example, if you're putting in a new toilet, the 100 millimeter pipe requirement is a trickier proposition. So make sure you consider it. Here I set out the kitchen units with some battens to make it easier to get the pop-ups for the sink units positioned exactly where I wanted them to be. Now I chose a timber frame structure over brick cavity wall for this project. Both are valid options and the reason I chose a timber frame is because aside from the fact I'm not very experienced in masonry, I think you get a far option for your insulation choices and it's easier to make the building what we call airtight and you have one less trade to rely on to get you to that important position of a wind and water tight envelope where you can start on the internal fit out. For the competent but inexperienced DIY self-builder without masonry expertise, I'd always recommend the timber frame route and there isn't really that much difference in the cost. Now we'll get our DPC onto our trench blocks to protect our timber and then get the timber plate down on top which will provide the base for our timber frame and our floor. We don't need to think too much about this because we know everything is plumb level and to the correct dimensions from our careful setting out from the foundation and trench block stage. As it's a brick outer leaf, we'll set out all the openings using brick dimensions where we divide everything by 225 millimeters and we'll order the windows based on these sizes as far in advance as possible due to the long lead times of windows. Here I'm using 145 by 50 treated studs with a grade of C16 for the wall and nine millimeter OSB for the sheathing with a breather membrane over the top. Make sure to set out the membrane from the bottom up so any moisture in the ventilated cavity just finds its way naturally to the bottom. This is a really typical timber frame construction used by the major house builders throughout the UK, really tried and tested. And now with the wall plates at the eaves and you can see we've put the ridge one in place against the existing brickwork. We can cut and set in the rafters and we'll use the metal hangers that the structural engineer has specified to keep the rafters in place. I'm using a traditional detail for the roof as I've chosen a natural clay pan tile which can work at a shallow pitch as I'm constrained by the height of the eaves and the position of the existing first floor windows. These tiles are fairly easy for us seasoned novices to install as they come with a mechanical fixing system and a series of accessories to make it easier for someone without a huge amount of roofing experience to fix. 
Any water that gets blown through the tilt will be caught by the membrane and taken down to the gutter. We'll make sure to take account of the manufacturer's instructions for all the fixings, the eaves and the ridge vents in order to maintain any guarantees that come with the tiles. Now we can continue with the superstructure brickwork and normally I'd prefer the windows to be in before starting with the outer brickwork but unfortunately the delivery of the windows on this project were really delayed because they were coming from Sweden. I couldn't continue to wait. I took a couple of sample bricks from the house to a few brickyards and knowing my quantity based on square meterage, we order by the pallet and this is how they are delivered to you on the lorry to the site. This brick is actually just a protective screen and is not structural in the slightest despite how it looks and is tied to the timber frame which is the main structural element. The stainless steel wall ties are what tie the brickwork into the main structure. With the roof and wall sealed it's time to get our insulation cut and installed. Not the most enjoyable part of a build. Uh, make sure to have personal protection when you're cutting this stuff. We'll use expanding foam and foil to secure the bats and to cover any gaps and then it's time to protect from any condensation by installing a vapour barrier over the floors, over the walls and the ceiling. Insulation and its proper installation will be the difference between a comfortable and economic living environment and a troublesome space to heat or cool with the potential for damp and rot. And I think because you don't actually see this part, people tend to scrimp on both the materials and the workmanship. And I promise you, you will regret it for years to come if either you or your builder don't install the insulation and the vapour control layer with the care and rigour. Where warm vapour from people and cooking will condense where it meets the cooler outside air within the wall and the roof voids. So it's time to put our services pipe work in for our heating, for our water and for the drains above the floor and run our cabling for our lighting and our sockets. And we call this stage first fix. And this is another stage that a competent home builder can do simply by being well prepared and save a ton of money in the process. The key things to remember with all these services is to properly clip everything within the void especially any pipes running water. Insulate all the water pipes and allow time for access by both your gas and electrical verifiers to check your installations are safe and compliant. Because we've gone for a timber frame, fixing the windows is a straightforward affair. I size these windows with five millimeter around all four edges of the structural openings. So I've 10 millimeter in total to play with. We call that tolerance and it helps us to maneuver the windows in. And we use plastic packers with the help of these inflatable air pads while we're installing. And note the requirement for perm events within the head of these windows since because we're wrapping the whole thing in the polythene for our vapor barrier, we need to let the vapour out in a controlled manner somehow and this is the way we do that. With our brickwork complete and our guttering and fascia fixed and I used UPVC plastic to match the window frames here. Now it's time to step back, take a rest and enjoy the remainder of the project. Fitting out the interior with a lovely spacious kitchen, complementing it with floor and wall finishes but we'll save that for another day. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and thanks for listening.